we got to be very, very careful and very sure that we're wearing the, the, the armor that God has given to us. And, and I love Brother Ed's willingness to play the piano and uh, what he's been able to teach himself. It's inspiring to me. And uh, I'm not looking to take his place at all. But if I can be a blessing, if I can uh, be a backup, I absolutely will endeavor to do that. Um, 1 Samuel 17 this morning. 1 Samuel 17. My text for today is verses 38 through 40. And I wasn't planning on launching into a multi-part series so soon, uh, but the Lord had other plans, and this is going to be part one of what I hope to be a multi-part series. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 40. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head, and he also armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, uh, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with thee, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hands and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them into a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, for this time, for these people, for all that you've gathered here today. And uh, Father God, as we open up your word of truth, and uh, we learned in Sunday school this morning that your word is the dictionary. Your word is the definer. And uh, we look to that word this morning. Ecclesiastes 8.4 says, where the word of a king is, there is power. And we ask you to lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So what I want to talk about this morning is I want to talk about whose armor are you wearing? And a lot of the times that's not something that we, that we really give a lot of thought to. And uh, have you ever met people who say, well, the Lord told me to tell you. Well, if we're all saved, how come the Lord didn't tell me? How come I didn't get that message? And don't get me wrong. A lot of the times, you know, the Bible does say that iron sharpeneth iron. And it's good to have good godly counsel of friends and a Christian brother or a Christian sister. And to, you know, to sit around that table and to talk about things and talk things through. That absolutely very important in the life of a Christian. But when it comes to gearing up for battle, we got to make sure that we are wearing the armor that God has given to us. Now, can you imagine David? Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. And in my mind, I, I picture him about six foot four, like Dolph Lundgren from uh, was it Rocky Three or Rocky Four. When I think of Saul, I think of somebody that size, right? And I think of David more like Sylvester Stallone, and, and he's, you know, 5'10 on a good day, but really about 5'9, five, 5'8 five, and a half. And uh, the Bible says about David that he was a beautiful countenance, and, and there was something very, very special about him, but he was the last in a long line of brothers. And, and can you imagine if he was putting on this armor of King Saul? And uh, it would have weighed him down. He would have gotten crushed by Goliath in about 30 seconds. He wouldn't have stood a chance. And so we need to look at what armor has God given me as an individual? What has God called me to do? A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you that about two years ago, I was ordained into the ministry in an actual church ceremony with a pastor and uh, men praying over me in a circle. And it was, it was a wonderful time. It was a wonderful experience. But that's not when I became ordained in the ministry from God's perspective. That's not when I became a pastor from God's per perspective. Now, people could say to me, well, you're not qualified to do that job. And when I read 1 Timothy, I might be inclined to agree with them. However, however, when God called me to be a Bible teacher about 12 years ago, and I didn't realize it at first, I didn't understand what was happening. All I did is I fired up a, a podcasting software and 
got myself a microphone and began to set a day and a time for the first couple of years. It was just Sunday night from 9 to 11. And um, I started teaching the Bible and people started listening and they started coming alongside and they would have questions and I would do my best to answer those questions, not really even thinking about what it was that I was doing help. I was discipling other people. I didn't know that I was, nobody told me that that's what that was. And then one day <clears throat> I had a listener named Anna and she called me up and she said that she had gotten a bad report from the doctor and that she had liver cancer and it was likely going to metastasize to the rest of her body and um, would I pray with her? And then of course, that's where the NTEB prayer list came from. All the way back in 2012 and 2013, as people began to listen, as people began to ask questions, and as people began to say, hey, I have this thing in liver cancer and colon cancer and, and stroke and all these other different things. And then lifting up those prayers during the broadcast, well, when did I become ordained into the ministry that nearly everybody says I'm not qualified to do? And don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't disagree with them, but God gave me sheep. And from the moment that God gives you sheep, that's when you become a pastor, whether or not you have the title, whether or not it says that on your office door is when you are tending. I mean, who tends to the flock, the shepherd? And when you read all those verses in the New Testament about tending to the flock and, and, and you know, being overseers, that is a, a, a weighty responsibility. And so. When I, be, when I look in my own life and I see the armor that God has given me, I didn't recognize it at first. I didn't see that as something from God. I just saw that as, okay, I'm called to do this Bible study. I'm going to do it the best I can. I'm still kind of learning as I go. And yet, I guess God decided that this was the time for me to do that. How many times in our own life does God give us something? He opens a door. And do we have the courage to walk through it? Now, we love the story of David and Goliath. We love how he gets you know, those five smooth stones. But if you were on the ground watching him and you would say to yourself, what is wrong with this man? He doesn't want the armor. He doesn't want the shield. He doesn't want the sword. He's picking up rocks. And, and they're looking at Goliath with, easily 12, 13 feet tall, easily a thousand pounds, right? And they're looking at him and they're like, there is no way that this man is gonna get this job done. But was God talking with David or was he not? He was talking with David. Was David listening when God spoke to him? He absolutely was. Now, turn to verse 47 in the same chapter, and I want to show you this. First Samuel 17, 47, well actually we'll do, no, 45 through 47. Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, and I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. The name that is above all names, and at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. That's tough talk. That's tough talk. And I will smite thee with my little rocks. And... Take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing as witnesses? Aren't we supposed to be telling a lost and dying world, a world that is preparing itself for Antichrist? Aren't we supposed to be telling them that there is a God in Israel? And in our dispensation, 
Jesus Christ, crucified, died, buried, risen again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. Any way that we can take that message out, podcasting is a good way, church is a good way, gospel tracts is a good way, camp meeting is a good way, uh, fellowship among believers, iron sharpening iron, those are all good ways to, I mean, there's a million different ways that you can do it, but you got to do it. And you've got to have the courage of those convictions. And David says this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I want you to think about this for a second. What an honor and a privilege that it is that we can represent the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is an honor and this is just my opinion. I don't, I don't have a whole lot of scripture to back. I have some. But I believe that at the judgment seat of Christ, because we do these things, Paul says, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Okay, we know in part, we prophesy in part. Um, everything that we believe are black words on a white page in a book among a hundred million other books. There's about 127 million books in the Library of Congress, and there's one Bible. And, and, and everything that we know to be, when I got saved, March 14th, 1991, about five minutes to midnight, I opened up a book with white pages and black print. I read one verse of scripture, and so sorry to disappoint the, hy the hyper dispensationalist, but I didn't read anything Paul wrote. I read John 3:16, which just happens to match beautifully with Romans chapter nine and Romans chapter 10. And I read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, I write my name in there, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. I had no Christian friends. I didn't know any. I had never set foot in a Christian church. I had nobody rooting for me that I was aware of. Maybe God had placed some secret operatives in my life. I don't know. I know that I saw a gospel track one time in 1989. I was working on the set of a movie. I used to work in Hollywood. And uh, somebody had left that chick track called Somebody Loves Me. Have you ever seen that track? It's a yellow track. No words except to you get to the end of it. And it's a little girl who is being abused in an abusive family and situation. And she winds up dying in an alley in a box and it rains and she gets a fever and she just dies in that box but before she dies somebody gave her a gospel track and she read the gospel and then the last panel shows the angels coming to take her home i read that gospel track as a lost man in 1989 i got saved in 91 but i can't recall anything from that track that was spurring me on in 1990, I remember that now. I did not remember it on March 14, 1991. And I read these words in a book, in a world that has hundreds of millions of books written by people very smart and very intelligent. And yet, that one verse, after a year and a half spiritual quest, after my older brother had passed away, and I'm like, I got to find out who this God is. And, you know, 30 years of being a Catholic didn't teach me who God is. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, 30 years of reading good news for modern man was bad news for me. Um, but isn't it amazing that I can open this book being led, obviously, by the Holy Spirit. Um, and I can get saved on one verse of Scripture. Now... With that in mind, let's reread what I just read. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. On March 14, 1991, I found out that there is a God in Israel. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he loves me. And he went to the cross and Acts 20, 28 says it was God's blood that was shed. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, don't get me wrong. I... I believe in God the Father, the only begotten Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I believe that they exist separately. Um, the Bible doesn't call them persons. Uh, but I see one God that exists as the Father, 
He exists as the Son, and He exists as the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we have the honor and privilege to tell all the world that all the earth may know. This is going to the Gentiles too. That all the earth may know uh, that there is a God in Israel. You know what the Philistines didn't know? They didn't know that this was a church service. That's what they didn't know. You know what the Philistines didn't know? They didn't know that the gospel was being preached to them. Uh, you could almost call this kind of a, a, a meeting of the church in the wilderness that Acts talks about. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And now, getting to the verse that I was trying to get to. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. Huh. What are we going to do to put people in the seats? Well, pray. Who said pray? Pray all the time. There it is. Absolutely right. And to be led of the Spirit and to stand on this word, not to have dog and pony shows and pizza night and, you know, I got nothing against pizza night. Any Wednesday that anybody wants to bring a pizza in for before or after the service, I'll be the first. I like pepperoni. I'll be the first one grabbing that slice of pizza. But that's not one of the tools that we need to bring people in. We don't need to have movie night. We don't need to have any of those things. You can have a bus ministry and a bus. I have seen bus ministries be very effective in churches. I've seen them kill churches. And you know why they kill churches sometimes? Because the people have the wrong armor on. What did God call you to do? And one of the things that maybe you're starting, I guess I've been preaching here for about a month now, brother, maybe five weeks, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Um, but one of the things that God has called me to do is to be an encourager of the brethren and to say, hey, we can do it. Oh, that's what I was saying before about the judgment seat of Christ. I believe that when we get up there to the judgment seat of Christ, we understand this by faith right now. And I believe by faith that everything here is true. But I've, I've never seen, I've seen God work. I've never seen God. I have had him speak to me a thousand different times. I've never heard his voice. But up at the judgment seat of Christ, what did C.T. Studd say? He said, only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. You know what I believe, one of my own personal convictions about the judgment seat of Christ you is... Can imagine. What's that? I can only imagine. <laughs> exactly right. And I believe that when we get up there, and we realize that maybe we did a little bit of what we were called to do, but we let the world, the flesh, and the devil distract us and pull us away. I believe one of the things that many of us might say is, Lord, send me back. I can do it. I see it now. Now I know what we're supposed to do. And he's, you know what he's going to say? No, no. Nobody gets sent back. I told you what you were supposed to do. You may or may not have believed it. You may or may not have been talked out of it by somebody who had a word claiming to be from me. What does Jeremiah say? Uh, the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. Now, David had some good experience with the, with the, with the lion and the bear and whatever else that he did and fighting those animals. But fighting those animals is not the same thing as fighting a 13-foot-tall man who weighs close to 1,000 pounds. Uh, that man could have crushed a lion. With, with, he could have grabbed the lion by his throat and he could have just throttled him. Uh, while drinking a coffee with the other hand. And David had some experience. And the best part about David is he had the right attitude. The best part about David is he believed, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me long before it was ever written. And the Bible talks about the sure mercies of David. 
You know what the sure mercies of David are? Eternal security. Because he should have lost it and he didn't lose it. And what is that? Uh, Brother Ed was talking about types. That is a type in the Old Testament of eternal security. And uh, God said to David, you're a man after my own heart and I got you and I'm going to hold you up. And uh, that's what David is, is a type of. And here in verse 47, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. How do we start our day? Do we start our day uh, usually with a cup of coffee or tea or whatever? But do we start it with the news or do we start it with the good news? Right? That's, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be in this book and saturated with this book because this world is going to be throwing all sorts of ninja judo moves at us and we can so easily get pulled off to the side, so easily distracted, so easily confused. But David wasn't confused because he put blinders on and he says, I'm going to follow the Lord. And this is what the Lord did for him. Uh, let's look at the anointing of David. Uh, go back one chapter to 1 Samuel 16. And let's just read a couple of these verses, starting in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord, can you imagine being a prophet of God? but you're afraid of an earthly man. You're hearing directly with your ears from God. You are watching him do miracles through you. Just like in Acts chapter nine with Ananias. And Jesus said, go to the street, which is called straight and do this thing and let him see again. And he's like, Lord, I don't, I'm, I'm not doing that. <laughs> he's talking with the risen Jesus Christ. And so we begin to see that the number one person that we have to do battle with is not Goliath. The number one person that we have to do battle with is the person who looks back at us in the mirror. And that's a cliche, but that's very, very true. We've got to do battle against where our old man is trying to take us. And that doubt and that discouragement and all those things that pop up, that's where they come from. But this, right, this is wisdom and this gives you peace and this gives you reassurance. And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord and call Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show thee what thou shalt do and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto you. And then look down in verse um, six. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked upon Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither had the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by, and he said, Neither had the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord has not chosen thee. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, which means red, and withal of a beautiful countenance and godly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel 
rose up and went to Ramah. I want to give you four quick verses from Paul, and I want to balance this thing out. But I believe that these messages in the Old Testament and what we see David doing before the Lord and acknowledging that the battle is the Lord's. David took the responsibility that he was called to that place and that time. David took the responsibility that he stepped up to the plate when all Israel was cowering behind Saul and nobody had the guts to do anything. David did what was in front of him to do, just like you and I are called to do what is in front of us to do, whether it comes to building up this church congregation, whether it comes to what sort of uh, evangelistic presence do we want to have in the streets and in the town, and how do we do all these different things, we as a church have to step up and say, okay, each and every one of us is going to do what God puts in front of each and every one of us, but that's not where the victory comes. That's obedience. That's our sanctification. That's God calling us and saying, will you step up and do this thing? Just like back in 2020, when everybody was on lockdown and all these churches were closing. Um, the church that I went to at the time, uh, they had parking lot services. And thousands of the people who read our website had no brick and mortar place to go. And so people began to encourage me, well, why don't you start a Sunday service? And I'm like, well, because I, I, I never thought of doing that. And I prayed about that. And God said, well, why don't you do that? And I'm like, Lord, I don't have any experience doing that. I do the Bible study. I do whatever else that I do. And he's like, well, why don't you just step up to the plate anyway? And we've been doing that for four years now. And people have gotten saved through it. And people have gotten encouraged through it. Right? I don't have to figure out how the battle gets won. I know who wins the battle. And in every dispensation, guess who is the one that wins the battle? It's the Lord. Amen. That carries over in every dispensation, whether it's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, whatever label Larkin puts on the dispensations, whatever label that Ruckman puts on the dispensation, in every dispensation, the battle is the Lord's, and we need to lean on him, but at the same time, okay, Lord, you want me to pick up those five smooth stones and go after this guy who is unbelievably large. I've known people who were six foot five, six foot six. Somebody came into the bookstore a couple of months ago, and I don't know, I just have this thing. When I see really tall people, I go up to them and I say, hey, how tall are you? Um, just, just because I want to know, it's like, wow, that person looks like they're seven feet tall. How tall are they actually? And I've stood in the presence of men who were six. My older brother was six foot six. I've stood in the presence of men who were six foot seven. And even one time I met somebody who was six foot eight. And that is, you feel like, like a grain of sand inside the oyster. Six foot eight is unbelievably large. Well, how much bigger was Goliath than that? And David says, yeah, that's what I need. I don't need a sword or a spear. I don't gotta protect myself. I don't think he was being irresponsible. I don't think he was being arrogant. I think what he was doing is that he was listening to what the Lord was telling him to do. And so many times, we want to have like this great experience. We want to have this nugget of wisdom. And God says, hey, why don't you just believe the book? Why don't you just read this book and believe this book? And like what Brother Ed said this morning, it's so very, very true. There's been many things that I've read in this book that didn't make sense. And I looked it up in the dictionary and, and the concordance. I'm like, well, that shed light, <laughs> but I don't know what kind of light that I... I look at it different, but I haven't solved, solved the question. And <clears throat> you keep reading this book and reading this book, and then all of a sudden, I've had experiences where prayers were answered when I'm in some obscure passage, and all of a sudden, the Lord just says, hey, 
That's what you gotta do. That's the answer. And it's like, how does that happen? It happens because when we pray, that's us talking to God. And we should. And Paul encourages that. But that's just us talking to God. When we pray, that's not God talking to us. When we read this book, that's God talking to us. So let's read just four quick verses. Romans 13. Romans 13. Let's look at verses 11 through 14. In that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than we believed. I'll get that done. I got plenty of time. How, how many times have you heard people say that? I've known people over the last four years who thought they had plenty of time. And those people are dead right now. And some of those people were close friends. People I saw a lot. People I street preached with. People I saw every Sunday at church. You don't know how much time that you have. You may think you have a lot of time. But you don't know how much time that you have. And Paul says, you better wake up and get something done. Verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I submit to you, that's the, the armor that David put on uh, in the Old Testament without knowing that he was doing that. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, nor in chambering and wantonness, but uh, not in strife and envy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Paul is saying, you got to battle the world, the flesh, and the devil. you got to battle that man or that woman that you see in the mirror. And you better know that your time is short. Your time may be very, very short. Um, we have it. I can remember when I was young, having a grandparent die and you shed some tears and you miss them very, very much. But there wasn't like that sense of immediacy because when I was growing up, grandparents and grandchildren, there was kind of a separation, you know, not as close as they are today. And I can recall losing a grandparent and it bothered me and I missed him very much. And I think I shed a tear, I was like 13 or 14, um, but it wasn't anything like when my brother died. It wasn't anything like when my mother died and when my father died. And Paul is saying that knowing the time that it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. Um, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter six. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and let's look, starting in verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 3. <clears throat> no, that's not the one I want. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I must have screwed up the address when I was putting my verses down. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look at verses uh, 10 through 17. 10 through 17, and I'll be done for today. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. And again, it is not the armor that we may think that it is. It is the armor that God has for you as an individual. Now, we understand what this armor looks like and, 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 and how the Bible tells us about these things that we're about to read. But just as David couldn't put on the armor that was meant for Saul, each and every one of us can't put on somebody else. We can't look at our neighbor and say, they're doing something that's working for them. I'm going to do that same thing. Maybe it will work for me. Don't get it from a neighbor, get it from God. Amen. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, it was funny. David knew that God had anointed Saul to be king, and David wasn't going to take over that position until Saul had finished whatever that God had called him to do. And so David dealt with Saul as a man and as with the king of Israel. But then there 